Well, we have arrived at our ending keynote, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce Tom Pfeiffer. All right, let's bring it home. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here for a second year. I really appreciate it. Um, my world has changed a little bit. Um, this time last year, I was planning to be uh, working more in resilient position navigation timing. But as it would happen, after maybe 30 years at Booz Allen, things do change often. And um, I found myself responsible for the entire Air Force business, which gives me about 2,000 people and 25 Air Force bases, and uh, but still has a GPS in my uh, portfolio. So we'll talk about the timing. It's all about timing, right? Um, but I, I, you know, I want to wrap it up, first of all. Took lots of notes here. Really, those of you who are here, this is the choir. You are all the choir. Um, I've met you, I've talked with you, many of you, the vendors, the capabilities. Um, great notes, great presentations across the board. Really appreciate everything everybody said. Um, I'm going to try and take this in a little, little different way. Um, first, I'll start off with a, you know, my background really is DOD and Intel. That's the most part of it. I work in other markets, but so I you know, see a, a DOD and intelligence um, view on all these things. I'm just tainted, you know, over 30 years in this world, and I, I don't trust anybody. I don't trust any, anything, and I think everything, nothing, is, uh, as it seems. So uh, with that in mind, just please accept that uh, this is where I'm going with this. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in the late 1970s, we had Navstar. It was ours, DOD Intel. Nin end of 1990s, we had a full capability up of GPS, secure. 2000, we made it available to all of you. And, uh, and under, under Bill Clinton, I think we talked about a lot of that afterwards, and uh, that's interesting to see where that went. Of course, we, I do appreciate my personal iPhone and all the things it does for me, except when I'm in urban canyons, as you mentioned earlier, Mike. Um, and then it's not so reliable. Um, so, you know, 2018 years, really only 18, year, 18 years with GPS and uh, 3 billion users now. And uh, I think I saw a slide Thad showed me, Thad Allen, that said uh, earlier that uh, the net value of this uh, super utility, the super free utility, amazing, is uh, 60 billion a year. I don't know how they equate that or, or figure that out, but, you know, what the heck, 20 bucks a person for three. Uh, could be. So, great. We looked at the, we talked earlier about the critical infrastructures. This conference is time and money. It could just as easily have been time and energy, time and defense, time and commercial, um, time and manufacturing. Um, these are, when I thought about it, in a lot of ways, we talk about timing and the effect on the stock market, but also um, the time also expects, affects the value of the things we're trading. You know, nefarious behavior, you know, I'm a, I'm a non-trusting guy, so if I can manipulate something somewhere for some advantage, and I'm from another country or wherever it might be, I might do it. I might change the value of, of my, the stock of my competitor, and they may be commercially, you know, commercial company. Uh, and uh, they're all relying on GPS. Everybody relies on GPS um, for everything. ATM transactions, gasoline transactions, pumping, uh, the traffic lights. When the GPS goes out, they default to red. I can, I can, I can uh, create quite a mess. On the, you know, in the New York City and other places. Um, so I thought I'd bring your attention to something I talked a little bit last, last um, year, but I just want to foot stomp it a little bit because there's a few things I want to bring out. There was a, um, a good briefing presented, and it's on YouTube. It's uh, by CNN, and it's called War in Space. If you haven't seen it, anybody seen it, War in Space? It's very real. Um, it's 43 minutes. It's it's. If you haven't had a class, who has not had a classified briefing? This is your opportunity to have a classified briefing on YouTube. It really is. And why did uh, General Hyten share that? I think he wanted the world to know that there's vulnerabilities. And that's how he starts out. And so uh, Warren Space, General Hyten leads Stratcom. And um, four star, and he, uh, he cites the, the challenges he faces um, with GPS. And, 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 and he worries not about the military systems as much as he worries about the civil infrastructure and the homelands and all the things he goes through. He does get through and talk about the, the military as well. But he said, you know, someone says, oh my gosh, we lose GPS, it's Armageddon. No, it's not. It's 1970s. You know, um, the, you know the, the warfare, the war capabilities are Vietnam era warfare capabilities. And um, 
but we've been there. So they are going through the exercise of preparing for war without space assets. Why is that? The capabilities we have right now on orbit, the GPS capabilities, were designed 15 years ago. They have no anti-satellite capabilities, defensive capabilities. They're vulnerable. We know where they are. We know where, exactly where they are, when they're going to come around. They're 12,000 miles up. They circle the Earth twice. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Mark, 30 satellites. Easily something can happen to them. So, we, um, so it's interesting. Uh, General Buck... Um, goes through the kind of capabilities that go on in J, the JSPOC in, in this war in space. And, um, you know, we, we, if you want, you can take a walk uh, through Schriever. I, Schriever is not far from where I live in Colorado Springs, and I've been on the base there and been through these offices, but perhaps many of you have not. And uh, you may be surprised to find out that the, uh, the station-keeping community for each one of these critical satellites, like GPS, which we talked all day about, it's a little room, and in that room, are seven military folks and one contractor, seven, eight together, that do all the station keeping. That's it. Um, I think so, um, I think I'll go to, I got, I got just three slides. I'm assuming the green button advances there. Let's see, oh yeah, look at that. Um, let's go to the first slide. We talked about the GPS system failure, this 13.7 microsecond um, like uh, change. Um, let me give a little more color commentary on that. Um, they, it's a patch. You know, there's, there's all these different versions of software on all these different you know, capabilities. They don't launch all you know, the satellites at one time. Lo and behold, they start uploading the software. It's a routine operation. These eight people probably immediately understood that there was an issue. However, they didn't know what the issue was. It took about 12 hours to fix it. And because uh, satellites, you have to be in field of view to update. But that error, propagated itself around the world and, and, and different effects with different receivers. It took 48 hours for that error to be cleansed, so to speak, from all these uh, uh, systems. In that time frame, as we talked about, holdover clocks, some of them failed, and so they had, you know, receivers had to be reset. How much did it cost? No one really knows, but estimates are $3 billion, maybe more. One, you know, 13.7 like for a second change, just an error. So that's, that's what I call kind of the accidental error. So we, um, the fix, a lot of the fixes are in this room right here. You know, it's more sophisticated receivers. It's, it's longer, you know, greater um, um, holdover clocks. It's uh, alternate sources of timing. Um, these, these can be resolved, but you have to anticipate this is going to happen. This is just, that was just an innocent software error. error. So, you know, that's number one I wanted to share with you. You know, as we go down this path here. So then I go down, okay, well, that's just an innocent error. Um, let's go down the path of a little bit more. And, and I have more examples. And this is an old story, right? GPS jamming at Newark Airport. Everybody heard of that one? That's pretty simple. Cheap, uh, cheap uh, GPS um, uh, jammer. Hey, here's your price. I think we got it for uh, $57.90 and uh, free delivery. Look at that. Um, so you too can have a jammer. This was a uh, you know, personal privacy device. This is sold, and uh, you, uh, you put it in there so your boss can't track you, which this guy did. He kind of you know, wanted to go work a little bit, you know, put it uh, on the cigarette lighter of his car, and went and, uh, went and parked. He happened to choose to park near Newark Airport, you know, near Airport and, and they happened to have just upgraded their, uh, their precision landing capabilities, and they had these weird outages. What a weird thing, you know, and they don't know why it is, because it's very sporadic. The guy would then go back to work. Um, so they, uh, they tracked them down, and lo and behold, um, you know, they, they, they made some adjustments. But the thing that's interesting about this is what's going on now is that, uh, again, I call this an accidental jamming. This is accidental. There was a little bit of mention earlier today of other potential accidental jammings, right? You know, bandwidth is in, is in short supply. We're talking about, uh, you know, some of the, the bandwidth has been sold off, and now there's uh, a great debate on what to do with that bandwidth and whether that bandwidth is too close to the GPS uh, Line, right? Everybody heard about that. That's the potential for a, a big, you know, self-inflected um, disruption. Uh, hopefully, you're all preparing for that, right? Because it's going to happen. It's probably going to happen. I know that we, bad hopes it doesn't. And he's, you know, very optimistic, and I am. I am too. I share your optimism, but I'm not really. I, uh, I think it's going to, you know, these sort of things kind of march their way through the system. Um, there's a great organization um, called the Institute of Navigation. 
don't know how many people here are card-carrying members of the ION. I'm not, I don't sell subscriptions, so it's okay. ION, no one? All right, got a few people here. It's a good place to be. Why? Journals, all sorts of things about mitigating jamming, mitigating risks, antenna designs, um, algorithms. It's just tremendous. I, you know, I, I go to the Joint Navigation Conference uh, in uh, Dayton, last couple of years in Dayton, tremendous thing. So I, I'm just saying that as a community service to you, there are sources out there of other, you know, kind of interesting information about um, mitigating the threats and risks of PNT. And uh, NT, he's a big part of it. So I look at those things and I think, um, but, you know, there's a lot of accidental jamming that goes, it's going to happen. And, and we talked a lot about it. It was interesting with the, where they place these antennas on the roof and things like that. And so it's, uh, it's amazing it works at all. Um, so let's go now to the, my, my favorite end of the business, the nefarious acts. Not my favorite, but my favorite thing to try and address and resolve. I think about um, this all the time. Um, you know, hey, GPS, we said, it's 12,000 miles out there and it's got the, the power of a 30-watt light bulb. Um, that's pretty weak. <laughs> and it's an unencrypted, you know, um, CA code. And um, it's 15-year-old technology right now. It's available. And guess what's happened in 15 years? A, a lot of work advances have been uh, made in uh, software-defined radios and other capabilities. Easily replicated, easily uh, with, a, with a stronger signal. So this ability to manipulate GPS, it's just um, it's just fortuitous. We haven't seen this more, um, or maybe we have, and we just don't realize it. That's why it's kind of pressing people throughout the interviews. My questions are always about how do you know? How do you know you're not being, it's not being spoofed? How do you know it's really that person? You know, uh, how do you, you know? Because I always look for telltale signs of something that looks seems strange and odd. I may even give the benefit of the doubt to the actual operator. You know. Um, you know, I, I don't usually look at nefarious behavior as the person with the system. I look at nefarious behavior as the third party. And so I, um, you know, I started thinking about this. And this particular example, this is a pretty simple example. There's many, many more examples, but they are classified. So we'll just talk about this one. You know, 20 plus ships found themselves, uh, you know, on land. <laughs> you know, and uh, but there was just their GPS that was modified. Uh, and and there's, you know, they're, what the hell? They were 30 miles from a, from a Russian port, and. Um, the Russians are masters at this. Um, but those are errors in miles, errors in time that we're talking about here are fractions, just fractions and fractions of seconds. So who's to really notice that? It's not as physically observable. And so, um, you know, so to that end, the Air Force hosted a DT NAVFest, you know, developmental test NAVFest um, last year, you know, six months ago or so, at Edwards Air Force Base. Again, Edwards Air Force Base, if you haven't been there, it's in the middle of nowhere. Huh? Nowhere. So, and uh, there they came, brought out lots of capabilities and they did a lot of testing, jamming, spoofing, brought in uh, University uh, I mean, uh, of Illinois, Stanford, other universities. They brought in a lot of the labs and they tested the heck out of it. They were very careful in how they tested it because, you know, you don't want to you know, have a, in, incidental uh, damage and so they uh, they would uh, they they had to, they spent more time on the uh, the uh, the test environment and when they were going to test and created a little dome thirty thousand feet high and uh, and a certain and they're out in Edwards and they would test from one a.m. to six a.m. <laughs> and uh, and they learned a lot so the military expects to be jammed and spoofed and they're preparing for it. Their war game, their, they have war plans for it. Their, but this community is not as much, I don't think. I don't think, we're busy. We're busy trying to do things more sophisticated, in a more sophisticated way. The, the presentation we just had was very interesting. Bots doing this and bots doing that. It's all about automation. It's all about the realm of possibility leading forward. Whereas the world I'm living in is like, how could somebody exploit that realm of possibility? And I don't just get involved, and we don't just get involved in the defensive part of it. So we, 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 we do the, the red testing so we can prepare the blue force, so to speak. And, um, and so I, I would like, you know, as we prepare for the, you know, the next round of, you know, what's next in, 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 in time and money or time and whatever it might be, is how do we look at secure timing? How do we do some war gaming? Um, one of the things that Booz Allen does... Um, are, are hackathons, a hackathon. And it's not a hackathon, isn't it fun? We hack, hack real things. We hack the sky. 
we hacked maritime electronics. We bring in, I, I don't think I would, I would, I would hack the exchange, but I don't think I'd do it in public, but because it's, it's tricky what you find. We did a couple of public hackathons on, on shipboard electronics. And that's why I was asking a little bit earlier, and some of you, uh, you know, I was asking about, you know, the, the components you have on your electronics here. We exploit everything, every single thing. It's not just your general entry. Every single piece part component, every circuit board, every little chip, if there's a vulnerability on it, we would look for it. We don't play the game the, the way they usually, we don't walk in the front door. And so in the, in the hack the ship mentality, it was like, what could we do to, what could people do, nefarious people do to a, uh, a ship? And it's like, okay, we can, we can modify the radar. We're not changing the radar, we just got access to the bus and, and overloaded, uh, overlaid another radar platform. A lot of the software doesn't check for that. So we just looked at what it checks and what it doesn't. It was just, it was like we were sitting in Austin, Texas and we overloaded with some, uh, so, uh, some radar profile from uh, El Segundo. It just displayed it fine. And uh, we changed the GPS, just like the Russians did, just like Todd, Todd Humphreys did on a, a demonstration he did on, uh, on another ship. And uh, we changed everything. We, cha we made alarms go on. We made autopilots you know, change, steer the boat. All these things, not to demonstrate we could do it, we did, and we earned, and people who did it, we actually hosted it, and, we, and people got points. But we want to see what people could come up with with their software-defined radios. Interestingly enough, they didn't, they didn't have any idea about shipboard electronics or how it was configured on day one. On day three, when points were being awarded, it's unbelievable what they were do, able to do, modifying every single piece, piece part component. And that's with three days. So I wonder when I look at the electronics and the whole chain of, of transactions for the financial system, how much and how well would that survive a hack? For the, good, for the good of exposing goodness. I mean, you don't do this, you do it for points, but you know, you also do it to understand the vulnerabilities and then hopefully someone will take action on it. The only problem in this system we're all working in here, there really isn't anyone to take it to. In the military, they care. You know, they, they have a vested interest in making this thing survivable. Here, we're really wrestling in the financial industry of who really owns this, these transactions in time. You know, who, we talked about timestamps and time standards and things like that. It seems like there's, uh, my feeling is there's a, a coalition of the willing. And, um, you know, so I, um, I, I will have to wrestle with that some more on, on who, would, who would, who would, you know, certainly Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security should care and do care and they're coming online, but you need to bring them to attention of more like a more jolt and so, uh, but I'm telling you right now, um, the Navy, the Army, the, the Air Force, the uh, Intel are preparing for nefarious behavior. They see it all the time, all the time. Um, in fact, the Army leads something called assured position navigation timing, which is not GPS-3. The Air Force is leading GPS-3 because that's going to be a stronger signal, and more encrypted, blah, blah, blah. But Others are saying, even if that's not available, because we know where the satellites are, we know that our, nefer you know, our, our nation state adversaries have anti-satellite capabilities. And as I said, our satellites are not protected, so we need to be able to operate without it. We do in the military, and my recommendation is we find a way to call attention to that in, the, in, the, in the, this market here, as well as the other critical infrastructures. Because, uh, so, I, um, so the next, uh, let's see. Um, I think I'll go to the, my, uh, my second to the last slide here. So I took an attempt at this, but I'm gonna scrap this. You know, I, you know I, I played around with this, but I have changed my mind. In this scenario, which I was looking at here, a GPS spoofing impact on the finance. Um, you know, I thought I'd put a picture here with, uh, you know, high frequency traders and uh, institutional traders. I'm feeling very much like I'm in your world. You know, I, um, I, uh, I thought that, uh, you know, there's been some, modif I learned there's some modifications to the network management systems, you know, since 2007. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Uh, George briefed that. Changes in, in, in open up the markets. Fragmented U.S.'s markets, large investors, you know, are trying to vacuum up liquidity. I'm glad that you introduced liquidity earlier in the presentation because I thought uh, that was good. No one else had talked about that yet. And um, from multiple trading venues. And I thought, you know, the problem is that liquidity vanishes uh, as uh, high-frequency traders since the you know, the presence of, a, uh, and I love this term, the whale, in, um, in one venue and then alters orders uh, to other venues before the whale can, can uh, you know, complete the, the order. And so this is the real world. This is the world that we live in. This is the world that bots do. And um, 
That's great. This is how the you know this is how the game is played. You know, but then the whale strikes back. This is very exciting. You know, countermeasures. You know, smart order routing, uh, soars, monitor round trip times. You know, timestamps, break orders into small orders. Try to get their orders to hit the market at exactly the same time. So I thought, okay, well that's you know the balance of trade. You know, people are you know there's there's measures and countermeasures, and then counter countermeasures, and then counter counter countermeasures, and that's the world I love and live in. Um, and so you're doing it. But then I thought, well wait, wait, wait. And I looked at this and I thought, but there's a vulnerability in there. If, um, if market reliance on these timestamps opens up a vulnerability to manipulation. And the manipulation, as I was threading through here, is to modify the time or timestamps at one exchange or another to appear as if a round trip or you know, the time it takes to get to a transaction is different than it really is. And so I was you know, talking to some of our vendors here uh, during the break and you know, maybe there's maybe it's secure. It's 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 protected. But I started thinking about all the components, and again, in my paranoid way, uh, thinking about all the electronics, in the um, in the defense world, you know, we look at supply chain certification. We look at every single piece part. You know, here's a retired lieutenant general, Chris Bogdan, and he was responsible for the Joint Strike Fighter, the Joint Strike Fighter J-35. Very complex aircraft, probably the most complex in the Air Force. A lot of piece parts, I assume, right? And every single piece part is validated for the source, down to magnets. Why? Because people can exploit that, can and do. And um, we don't do that here in this financial institution. And I'm not taking against anybody because the prices, maybe, maybe if you did it, your product would be outpriced. You know, I, I get the economics of that. But I would like to drive that toward, you know, work with you, Patrick, is sort of get this, at least in the forefront, that ne nefarious actors now insert capabilities in, in, in the lowest price chip on the, on the, on the market or, or, or the things like that. So that is the world I live in. That is how they get it. And it's not what you think. It's, 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 it's built in without you even knowing it. It's sleepers right there. It subtly puts little changes. It subtly exfiltrates data. It, it just does these little things. I'm not, you know, and that, that is, Maybe it's happening now, maybe, hey, no one wants to do it to you, but they sure as heck want to do it to the world I live in. And uh, so we take that very seriously, and that's something, again, bringing it home where, where I think it's important. Um, this is, um, let me um, go to the last slide here. So what's next? This is where I kind of bring the linkage to the, uh, network security and secure time. I really think that cybersecurity, um, secure time, and, and from my view, and I know you don't think this way perhaps, but I think it's electronic warfare. And I don't trust any piece part, any component, anything I, I might go in and position as I, I you know, don't. So, and maybe you shouldn't either. I think you shouldn't. So, um, you know, I look at this stuff and I say, okay, let's look at the timing. Well, it's a nice little charts. The SEC did a survey, and in the survey it says, oh, 6% based on GPS. But we don't really believe that, right? Because, oh, the rest of this is PTP and NTP and CDMA, and, and guess what? Really, a lot of the source for that is uh, GPS. And why? Because it's, you know, it's a free, $6 billion free super utility. Hey, you know, you know I, have a, I have a Fitbit. Is that really a time? It's slave to this, which is slave to GPS, you know, my, my iPhone. So um, these are not two time sources. <laughs> these are one, one and the same. Um, so. Uh, you know, I, I look at this stuff and I, I love to be a part of the community, you know, and, and think through this sort of thing. I, uh, I think of what's next. I think about timestamps. I think about re-architecting as, uh, as the MIFID kind of requirements are coming online. Maybe it's the window of opportunity. This requirement is a forcing function um, to, to put more security, uh, 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 timing security and resilience into the system. Timestamp audits, resilient timestamps, timestamp validation, clocks—you uh, know—the critical infrastructure, things like that. Um, the um, that's uh, that's pretty much what I want to leave you with. I think I'm on time here. I got a few minutes left here, and um, six minutes and one second. Up, oh, six minutes now. Um, time moves on. The uh, I uh, so hopefully you know I. This is interesting to you. You know, you maybe learned a little something you didn't know, a little different, or you thought about it a little differently, or how I think about it. Um, I'll always bring the, you know, the, the distrusting. Uh, you can trust me to bring in the distrusting part of the uh, everything that never, because I, I look for how it can be broken or manipulated or, or spoofed or changed, 
And I know that all of you, many of you, are living in the world of the realm of possibility. It's so exciting. What could I do? What could I do? What could I do? What could I do? Bots? How can I do faster trading? How can I do these? The capabilities are in this room, and we know how to make this, this system resilient. It's just the will to do it. And um, it's not, you know, it can be done. And, you know, get other sources like, you know, Eloran and other capabilities. It's, it's, it's a resilient capability can be there. So um, with five minutes and nine seconds, I'll stop there. And uh, any questions or thoughts, comments? Or this is a work, this is a workshop. So we, uh, I make, you know, I, I have no problem calling on one of my people in the room for a lifeline. But uh, just comments. Tom, you mentioned uh, a number of other industries. Um, of course, our focus here today is the financial yeah. industry. Are some of these other industries, you know, thinking along the kind of terms that you do when you're thinking about um, you know, hardening things properly for the military? You know, I, I really, you know, Thad and I were talking about, you know, Thad, our you know, former commandant of the uh, Coast Guard, you know, travels in circles a lot with the Department of Home Security. And throughout the day, we have kind of talking about whether or not this resonates with, with with all the, the critical infrastructure. I do in certain, you know, when I'm not doing Air Force work, I do travel to the science and technology part of DHS. I haven't seen that sense of awareness, that sense of urgency, that sense of the threat. It's like this lack of leadership, this ownership, and you know, you pick, pick your poison. This is a very vulnerable underbelly. The defense itself of the, you know, the nation thinks about it and is still vulnerable, but they're preparing for it. But our infrastructure, energy, you know, um, transportation, others, I think they're still in the idea of what they can do with the realm of possibility, which is always exciting. The flip side is how do you protect it? I don't think so as much. But we're gonna, but I'm gonna drive that home. If I, yeah, please. Yeah, just in general, <clears throat> uh, there have been a couple of analogies made that uh, technology is overtaking the ability of government to ingest it and deploy it or regulate it or make policy. The current presidential directive that guides uh, PNT, that's space-based PNT, not PNT, which is probably what it should be, uh, is 2004. It is outdated, and the governance structure is going to have to be changed because technology is overtaking policies and procedures and the ability to cope with it in the ways we've talked about here today. And one of my highest priorities in talking with folks, and I serve on the PNT advisory board to the GPS XCOM or PNT XCOM is to rewrite that PDD and get the governance structure right so you can get answers, things can move faster, and we can keep up with technology. So, you know, all of us will keep pushing on this thing. I think it's important to get it right. And, uh, and again, if it's a level playing field, you'll all play well. Yes. So in terms of market manipulation, one possibility to look at is that someone cleverly infects a series of asset managers or other people who are doing trades. And the first thing they do is trigger those applications to tell them when the asset manager is going to make a decision. Hmm. So the, the asset manager decision maker is an algorithm, but we've infected it to say when the algorithm does something, it's going to go to an order management system and then to a but first, before it does that, ping me, okay? The second one, which is even scarier, is if I can infect it to ping me, can I infect it to change what it does? So the asset manager is no longer actually in control of that, of that process. And most of the people on the buy side, no idea, no idea that that's yeah, that out there as a possibility. I, you know, this this just confirms you know the thoughts we were having that there's just vulnerabilities and stuff, and people are um, just blind to it. You know, you don't know what you don't know, and um, and so I think that as we think about a time in money three, if there is a time in money three, what would it look like? That would be very interesting, and, and maybe it's a a workshop in a in a in a in a, in a more you know protected environment or something like that. And we just dig into these things, and you would expose some capabilities it might be whatever but I, I i can't i can't imagine there aren't people that are trying to think of ways to take advantage of that 
it's just probably not on a, on a big enough scale. And that's why I was pressing, um, you know, with the, was it uh, Peter? You know, is Peter still here? Okay. Peter, take off. Um, you know, about uh, all the auditing he's doing. I was trying to find out, are you seeing any triggers? Are you seeing any flags? It's not just the individual might have issues, but is there some little subtle thing? Because people are very subtle about how they do this thing. It's not blatant. You know, what the Russians did was blatant. They're just screwing with people and say, you know, I moved you 30 miles. Got it, you know, that's, yes, you did. <laughs> but uh, that's good. Go yeah. Hello, it's uh, Janesh from NextGen. <clears throat> I wanted to get your opinion about something. Uh, I mean, many of us have been struggling across the financial community for many years, you know, discussing how to solve and support the financial industry with technology and services, not just for regulatory requirements, but... You know, banking, in my view, over the years has grown with building blocks of technology as it's progressed. It's caused legacy-based issues where poor documentation has led to vulnerabilities. But, you know, this technology is not really native towards banking. Banking as a te technology itself is just an enabler. Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest challenges we have is enabling, is, is trying to help businesses understand the vulnerabilities and the technology that they need to adopt, they need, they need to adopt, and they push back on cost. Yeah, they do right all the time, because a bank has to manage its cost to make money. But what we talk about in the industry today, and the costs of being able to implement this, whilst they're not insignificant, you know, they exist. And so, the, so what I wanted to understand from your perspective, maybe from a national interest perspective, is that. You know, what kind of view should we take upon trying to approach this for the future, right? We're not just trying to solve it for this year. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a really good question, and we wrestle with this. I, 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 your question resonates with me 100%. We, um, because you cry wolf, and it is a wolf, there is a wolf, but they're like... They're not financially incented to do that because it hasn't quite happened. The wolf is not at their door. And, uh, and this is such a low margin, as we talked about earlier, um, in the financial in industry, you know, low interest bearing uh, bonds and things like that. You, you're automating it. You're, you're really, you know, so, the, so who, they're trying to drive cost out of it. So I think the only way to do it is to really come in at the top. At, at, it's got to be a government. There's got to be some governmental driver. And it's more than compliance. It's rules. It's, and it could be architecture. I feel like perhaps the, you know, the wild west of tr the structure right now, perhaps there's more structure that needs to be added to it, but it's going to come from the folks that Dad was talking about at the Department of Homeland Security, these critical infrastructure, someone saying, this is what we have to do. Because otherwise, at the tactical level, it's pretty hard to get them to bite unless there's a fear. It, you know, they're, they're just not going to separate from the dollar. And nothing big has really happened yet. We've talked a little about that. No big event. No, that uh, has cost them in terms of liability. What I heard from the group last year was, oh, well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a government utility. If it fails, it's not my fault. I blame you, GPS. You know, and that, uh, that may or may not be, you know, that's, that may be the answer today. But as, you know, we need to change that before you have a market for consulting and helping. Because I know this community, like, again, the answers are here. The answers are in this community. We can solve this problem. We can have a better architecture, but we need a buyer. What do you call that? We need a we need a you know we need a maker to make the we got to create the supply. And uh, but we're going to do that. We're going to make a market. That's what I like. That is part of this you know forcing function in this community. Um, that's how I think about it. But it, until that happens, you know the buyers are few and far between unless they've been bit by something. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier in Europe, in Germany. Um, you know about the you know the different uh, security aspects. I think maybe you're a little little more conscious of the threats and issues, and maybe a little bit of further ahead, although it's not resolved yet, I don't think, right? No, but um, it's a good question. I, we're gonna work it. That's, that's, that's what this community is about. That's that when it, you're not gonna just not do anything till next time of money, right, Pat? We got things to do, right? That's right. No, thank, thank. Uh, any, any other questions? I can go all night, I'm not leaving till tomorrow. <laughs> I, I really, really appreciate everybody who was a presenter and all the, and all the questions that were asked by everybody. It's a great, it's a great day, and, I, and thanks to everyone who put it together. And thank, thank you for me for being a part of it.
becomes the cornerstone of what we do next year. It sounds like it might be really interesting. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for coming, and hopefully we'll see you here next year.